Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of Pound for Pound Boxing Report. Um, I'm your host, Michael. My apologies for starting things late for those who are checking us out live on, on YouTube. Uh, joining me this evening, um, Gail from Communities Digital News, uh, Daniel from the Inscriber, and, and, and always welcome fan follow of the show, Lisa. What's going on, ladies and gents? Good evening, everybody. There is a monster weekend of boxing ahead. Let's talk about it. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Um, for those who are new to Pound for Pound Boxing Report, Pound for Pound Boxing Report live YouTube show podcast as well as blog discussing all things boxing. The motto is when boxing, what, boxing is good, we will talk about it. When it's bad, we will talk about it. Bottom line is, if it concerns the sweet science, we will talk about it. If you want to, uh, if you want to uh, find all information about the show, what to follow us and all that stuff on social media, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, for now, the blog page is the place to go to p4pboxreport.wordpress.com. That's the link. Um, if you check out the blog page, um, top right of the blog page, you'll find it. Well, you'll find links to what to follow us on social media, uh, uh, Twitter, Facebook, uh, and whatnot. Links to what to check out the show on uh podcast platforms that distribute via rss feed you can uh, check out where you can donate um let please let donation be the best nation i don't it doesn't matter with me if it's a dollar two dollars five dollars uh, uh we'll really be grateful uh if you uh distribute a little if you give a little coin um you know, about the production and things otherwise behind the scene and let's last but certainly not least um a week away, a week away, as a matter of fact, I believe a week from tonight. Um, as I said during prior episodes, I am an um, online coach for Beachbody.com. Um, I am doing um, a group challenge um, that's built together in November, November uh, group challenge just in time for the holidays. It's based on the two on the new program, uh, one of the new uh, fitness workout programs on Beachbody on demand. Um, 10 rounds, which is a boxing based program, is consisting of um, cardio, which is consisting of boxing moves, also weightlifting. Uh, very simple um, yet challenging uh, uh, program. I think for those who, you, if you're interested in that, please hit me up on Pound for Pound Boxing Report Twitter page at P4P Boxing Report. Hit me up on my personal Twitter page, Brother JR76, or just hit me up on the uh, Pound for Pound Boxing Report blog page. Let's get things going this evening um a lot to talk about particularly when it comes to previewing the fight previews because um on halloween it is chock full of fights but again let's start things by going back um recapping what took place particularly uh uh this past friday we uh, i'll go to you gail because i know you have to uh, uh, uh dip out early um going to start with a triple header that took place in Mexico City um, last Friday, uh, featuring the Little Giants of the division. Um, let's start specifically in the Junior Bantamweight division. Well, there was a double header. Um, Juan Francisco Estrada defending his WBC belts again, WBC 115 pound belt against Carlos Quadras in the rematch. Um, Roman Gonzalez fighting. Um, Israel Gonzalez, um, Chocolatito defending his WBA 115 pound title. Let's start with the rematch between um, Quadras and Estrada and, and Gail. We we previewed the fight last week and we kind of had a question because it was hearing rumors floating around about Quadras in particular. Uh, uh, was he physically fit? Was he ready? Um, was he even going to put, take part in the bout? And not only did he show up, uh, not only he, did he fight, he gave uh, uh, Gallo Estrada all he could handle, particularly early on, uh, put him down, I want to say, at the end of round two uh, with a left hook, uh, was competitive all the way. But um, Estrada showed, that, showed why he's one of the best fighters in the world, uh, regardless of weight. Um, after the knockdown, you can see him. It kind of woke him up, and he started to slowly but surely start to come on, come on, um, landing shots, showing his boxing skill, his counterpunching ability, 
And over time, he started to show, slowly but surely uh, uh, wear and hurt Quadras, put him down three times in the 11th round, I believe, and finished him off in round 11. Um, were you surprised by how competitive it was? You know, just overall assessment of the fight. Those of us here on the Power for Power Report and all of you who are regulars know how fond our crew is here of the smaller weight divisions. We love us some super fly weights. We love us some bantam weights. We love the hardcore Mexican, Japanese, smaller weight division guys. There's just so much speed, action, and power for the size. And boy, this fight had it all. If you weren't a particular fan before, if you watched that fight, and you aren't hot to see some more of the top men in the smaller weight classes, there's something wrong with you. This, this had everything. This was a rematch, a long-awaited rematch. The first fight was in 2016, I believe, and it was a 114-113 times three, all three scorecards the first time in favor of Estrada. He won the fight on the basis of a single late round knockdown. So it's truly as close as you can come without it being a draw. This time, yeah, there were rumors. Quadras has had some losses since. Estrada's star had only ascended since then. So, you know, it had a thing because of the chatter and because of the way both men have looked. The Estrada would get a challenge. It wasn't a gimme, but he was absolutely the favorite. Well, <laughs> apparently, uh, Car uh, Quadras, El Principe, the prince, um, he wasn't going to make it easy. Uh, both of them came out swinging at the bell, going for it, and they never let up until the fight was finally stopped. Quadras was the first one to score a knockdown, and he caught Estrada multiple times by surprise with a really good hard right uppercut, and that was what knocked him down, followed by a left hook. Um, in the third round, dropping Estrada. And it was not a flash knockdown. It looked bad. Carlos tried to fi finish off Estrada. Um, he couldn't do it. Um, they hung, hung in there and kept roaring. Uh, Estrada was working really nicely to the body. Boy, there is nobody that delivers the Mexican left hook to the body like Estrada. Um, and he turned the tide through that. You could see Quadras was starting to lose steam. He was kind of on shaky feet, but he he was very determined. Give him enormous credit for hanging in there. You know, he looked like maybe Estrada was going to get in there and finish him, and he, he, you know, suck it up, roar back, rally, play some really good-looking headshots, and Estrada would say, okay, you know, he was going to still have to watch it. Um Estrada scored a, with a pretty nice sliver shot in the sixth round. Estrada's corner, you could hear them throughout the fight because there were no fans. It was in a TV studio setting in Mexico City at TV Azteca Studios. You could hear the corner screaming at him, finish him off, finish him off. Um, and he couldn't do it. Quadras practically crawled back to his corner, his mouth open, he's breathing hard. Quadras just kept coming. Quadras' trainer, Rudy Hernandez, after that sixth round said, hold your ground, look for that right hand, you know it's going to come. And so they went through three more completely brutal rounds, carrying on. Estrada would gain a little ground. Quadras would summon some superhuman effort and come back and counterpunch. And Quadras was willing to take headshots as long as he could guard against taking any more hits to the body. But at the start of the 11th, Estrada got Quadras knocked down hard right at the beginning of the round, first 15 seconds. The body shots had finally taken enough of a toll that Estrada got that right hook in and dropped him. Quadras got to his feet. He, he looked like he was going to try to suck it up. You figured he wouldn't last. Quadras dropped 
uh, Estrada dropped Quadras again, this time face down. And my rule is if you go down face down, you're not getting back up. Quadras got to his feet. He practically begged the referee to let him continue. The referee did let him continue, but, but that was it. Estrada knew now he had him. He had a good two more minutes in the round to work with. It took him about another 30 seconds of blasting Quadras before the referee did finally step in and save Quadras. Just an amazing show of heart and skill by both of them. They both looked good. He'll honestly, Quadras' um, reputation rose in my estimation from this defense. He just he hasn't looked the same since he lost to Estrada. This is the best fight he's had since then in a loss. And for Estrada, he's 30 years old. He's never looked better. He threw a career high number of punches. He threw 1,110 punches in far less than 11 rounds. He landed 387 of them. That's his second best total ever. It, it was a spectacular fight. If we had not had the Cepeda Baranchik fight, I would be calling this fight of the year. It was that good. Uh, I'll go to you, Lisa. First of all, you got a shout out from someone in the chat. Uh, um, D. Obianuli, I think that's the correct pronunciation. So I just want to uh, first acknowledge that. If you was able to see uh, this double header uh, that took place in Mexico City, uh, Estrada versus uh, Quadras to your assessment, your thoughts on that, as well as uh, a brief word on the fight between uh, uh, Chocolatito and Israel Gonzalez, Ch Chocolatito uh, winning by 12 round decision. Yes. Um, hey, Diaby and Nelly. Um, yes, the fight was, oh God, they were incredible. I was just amazed at those those little guys and shout out to my to my my, my main little man Cesar Julio Martinez I love that guy I really love him um the Strada and Card Quadros fight was was a classic that that was a war I was just like wow and he didn't come to lay down Quadros either he definitely didn't come to lay down and um Estrada I could see why he's um, pound for pound on the pound for pound list. He comes, he's just got so much technique. And um, I'm looking forward to uh, the second Roman Gonzalez fight with him. That's going to be a really great fight. And um, as far as Chocolatito fight, great fight, great fight, great fight. I'm just, what is he, 32 now? And just the combinations, I love his combinations. He is just, just, they don't get, I feel bad, like, far as the smaller weight guys, they don't get the credit that they deserve. They're underrated, like, to me. They really don't get the credit that they deserve. But I'm glad he on Pound for Pound Boxing Report, you guys, you know, acknowledged the smaller weights. And um, it was just a really great card. The Friday night card, really great card. And I love me some, uh, the little man, I love him, Cesar Julio Martinez. He's a little beast. Hey, you know, hey, uh, go ahead. What was the other question? Uh, uh, just basically your thoughts on the uh, uh, Estrada and Quadras fight as well, the rematch. Yeah, I, I talked about that earlier. I, I said okay. that um, I see Wash. Estrada is a pound for pound fighter. Even though he got knocked down, he got back up and he came back and he fought with everything within him. He he's a very skillful guy. And he's been on a pound for pound, many people's pound for pound for years. And um he's a very skillful technician. And um I enjoy watching him fight. Um that was like, like you said, one of the fights of the year. Um Quadros didn't come to lay down. He came to fight. He uh, came quick, to fight. Quick follow mm -hmm. up. You mentioned Julio Cesar Martinez. I didn't put that in the doc. And my apologies for that. Mm -hmm. um, he fought a, a, a guy by the name of um, um, Calleros, a um, late substitute. Um, blew him out in two rounds. Um, I mean, uh, Martinez, you mentioned he's a he's a exciting little guy. He got a mean streak in him a mile long. Um, more to the point, 
we've talked about this in the past on my sh on, on the show. Uh, more than the fight itself, it's the fact that um, Cairo's um, in another case of a fighter not tending to business outside the ring, uh, missing weight scheduled. To, the fight was at flyweight, uh, which for those who do not know, 112 pound limit weight limit. He comes in at 117 and a half. Uh, could you talk about if you have any frustrations about this? Uh, once again, um, I know he's a late substitute and all, but what is up with these fighters, uh, contemporary fighters, uh, not tech, not handling their business outside the ring in terms of making weight, Lisa? You know what? Um, I changed my prediction when I found out that he came in a few pounds over, like five pounds or four point something pounds over. And I was like, oh, he's coming in a little bigger, so he may kind of ragdoll him. But, I mean, I, I don't like that these guys do this. But, I mean, you know, they got to, you know, do better with that. But uh, what, can, what can you say? Uh, Julio Cesar, Cesar Martinez came in there and took his head off two rounds. But I don't like when they come in overweight like that. Either he needs to go up and wait or be more disciplined. I'm I'm not sure about this guy. I don't really have enough information on him, but I did look at some film study on him. But uh Martinez uh psh, took him out. But he gotta do better with that. Right. Um, I'll go to you, Daniel. Uh, um your thoughts on the uh, quadros, I mean the Australia uh Estrada. Uh, 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 um, Quadras rematched the the uh, the two Gonzalez's, Roman and Israel, um, and talk about give a quick word on your thoughts uh, about a potential rematch. Uh, the plan was that if both men win, uh, there is an offer on the table for them to fight in 2021. Um, of course, there will be a rematch of a fight of a fight that took place between the two uh, Thanksgiving weekend 2012. Uh, one of the fights of that year. A lot of people felt at that time that that Estrada uh, uh, won that first fight when they fought in November 2012. I personally thought that Chocolatito edges it out. But given uh, the progression of Estrada, Daniel, um, given how, in the minds of many, myself included, um, Chocolatito is not the fighter at 115 that he was at 105, 108, 112, uh, your thoughts? Rare is the fight that where the sequel could probably be better than the original. This qualifies, and especially after how we talked about Cuadras last week, because we were pretty much unsure that they, that he might make this. Seat. Oh, and not to mention the fact that. Apparently, somehow, this fight would have the chance. I don't know if they sorted it out last minute, but they had a chance where it was not going to be sanctioned by the by, by the athletic council in Mexico City. So it would have been a weird circumstance to fall into it. But you know what? Quadras won some points because for all the flack that we gave him during fight week, he came out and he showed out. He knocked down Estrada early, but, but he, unfortunately, he couldn't handle Gallo's body work. That was the main telling part of the fight. Gallo invested in the body. Quadras hung on as much as he could, but right around round 10, and especially round 11, it finally gave out. Like You could tell it was a struggle after that point for Quadras. And the referee stopped the fight. I think this is the first time that Guadalajara has, has been stopped in that fashion. You could tell how they felt, how Gallo Estrada's corner felt because of how that first fight turned out. And now you know how a definite winner. And Guadalajara is still a player in this division if he just can keep everything on the up and up. We just need to make, he just needs to make sure that he can keep it on the up and up. 
not have so much fluctuations going into, especially when they came to fight week, when people thought that you may be trying to get out of it. But my hat's off to them. Like, they gave a good fight. I agree with Gail. If we didn't have to pay up as a branch, like, this could probably be the front runner for fight of the year. Thoughts on the Chocolatito bout and and let's throw in Julio Cesar Martinez. We talk, I talked about it with Lisa just uh just a couple seconds ago, just a minute or so ago. Um how where do you think he fits in this picture? Um 112, 115 long term. Um in the lead up, he has well, how can I put this? He has mentioned in the past that um while he wants to uh, 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 he still has uh, he still has accomplishments to do to make to achieve at 112 pounds. He has a stated goal of eventually moving up to 115, fighting uh, Estrada, fighting Chocolatito, and whatnot. Given the given that 115 pound division with uh, Roman, given Estrada, given um, Tanaka, um, the likes of uh, uh Kazuto Ioka, Tanaka, and um, Ioka are set to are going to fight each other either late this year or, or early 2021, given Jernwin Ankanya's. Where do you see uh, uh, Martinez, who, as Misha, Lisa and I both talked about, um, he's a tiny little terror at 120 pounds. He may be the best fighter at the fight with division um, already. Um Long-term prognosis of of this uh, is, is Martinez. Who you know, he's a he's a he's 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 a whirlwind. Um, and he's a whirlwind, and he's on the come up for sure, Daniel. Uh, let me first tackle the Chocolatito fight first, because Gonzalez did come in and he did try to do as much as he could, particularly with body work and trying to slow down, but Dr. Tito, once he got that motor running, it was going to be tough to stop. It was a good decision by the judges to make him win, but like I mentioned, I, I mentioned and I agree with you, Gail, like when it came to this, I feel like 115 is the plateau for Chocolatito, where he's not going to be as good because not so much that his skill set doesn't translate, it's just the fact that it's just a bigger person than what he probably can do better. Now, as far as Martinez, like I said, I saw the highlights, both the fight, and then I started watching the highlights in his own. The dude is nice and crisp with his punches. He has good precision. He took care of Corrales when he had to. And it's going to be interesting if he goes to 115 because, okay, we know the standard bearer is right now. Right now, we know the standard bearer is Gallo. Chocolate, he could easily then jump into that area where the challengers come in in quadras because Arcanias, he may be able to hold off a little bit, but. I would probably say if you put if you put him against somebody like Chocolatito or somebody like Gallo, he would probably lose. So he could be in the mix as a contender already at 115. Right about when it's time to get hot again. And he looked big, big enough where he could probably do bantamweight as well. We know bantamweight has some heavy hitters waiting. So there's a bright future in this kid. It just it has to be what direction you want to go into it. If it's 115, you can easily put him in the contenders. And because he's WBC champion, he does have that little rule to his advantage where he can immediately challenge for the champion. So that's something to keep an eye on. Want to give, want to give a a shout out to a official boxing, official scorecard boxing science uh, who's joining us, who's listening live. In the live YouTube chat. Um, if you have any questions, if you have any comments about the fight itself, um, official scorecard, please don't be afraid to uh, mention them in the live YouTube chat. Uh, so it looks like um, Estrada and, and Chocolatito are going to fight early 2021. Um, 
if they based on what I've seen from both men, it's not that it's not that it's not that Choco Latito was not in, impressive um in his win versus um Israel Gonzalez. It's that for me, as I mentioned, a lot of people feel he's not the fighter that he was. He's not the fighter at Junior Bantamweight that he was at a lower weight. Um, I agree with that assessment. Um, I'm watching the fight. He's throwing punches and punches. He's throwing crew at uh, all kinds of angles. His activity is the activity is still there. The problem with me, uh, uh, ladies and gent, uh, Gail, Lisa, Daniel, is that. I know he won the fight against your fly, and I know he won by knockout, but a lot of that to me was about your fight and the fighter that he was not. And even in this fight with Israel Gonzalez, the if this was if this was a chocolate at 105 and 108 in particular, if that fight was if this fight was at 105 pounds, I feel that um Chocolatito would have uh, stopped Israel Gonzalez. It's not that I'm not. Uh, it's not that I'm hating on Chocolatito. I just think at age 33, um, with the wear and tear of a career against a, an Estrada, who who's going to be motivated for sure. I would pick Gallo um, in a rematch. And in terms of Julio Cesar Martinez, yeah, yeah, this 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 dude. Um, I know he's talked about unif unifying the titles at 112 pounds or fighting a unification bout, but why bother? Um, when Kosei Tanaka decided to move up to 115 pounds, uh, I felt that Tanaka and Martinez would have been a hell of a fight at 112. But uh, uh, Tanaka, for those who and for those who have not seen him, he is an outstanding fighter uh, from Japan. Um, as I mentioned, he's moving up to fight for the WBO Junior Bantamweight title against Kazuto Aoka either later this year, or early next year. Why waste time at 112 pounds with fighting, seeking a unification bout um, when it's going to be hard to achieve just because of uh, logistics and political red tape and sanctioning body BS? Get a couple more defenses in 2021. Um, and move up to 115 and put himself right back in that line. If Martinez, uh, folks, moves up to 115, am I wrong in thinking that that could that Junior Bantamweight could emerge into the best division in the sport? It, it's it's close to that right now. Uh, part of the reason that Martinez should move up. Uh, first of all, he wants to. He said after the fight once again, he would fight the winner of either of the other two fights in the evening, uh, which means Chocolatito, which means Estrada. I'll tell you, I would love to see him test himself if, <laughs> if he should dare. And I think he's a brash young man, and I think he might put him in against Quadras and see how he does. He says he's ready to move. Part of the reason is there is a little more marketing weight behind super flyweight and for that we have to thank peter nelson at hbo tom loffler tykin promotions all the folks who rallied around the first three super fly de facto fly super flyweight division tournaments that is also where nyoya inoue made his debut on an undercard in the United States. So if you hear, by the way, this weekend is his first American fight, uh, they're wrong. People need to go back and look at their recent history. It's because they don't pay attention to the smaller weight divisions. Let's all get on our harangue about that. But Martinez- well, it's, the same, it's the same problem that people who now want to claim that Teofimo Lopez is the undisputed lightweight champion of the right. world. No, he's not. No, he's not. So we can go in that. Well, and then we've got the lineal. Let's just, oh, man, we could all get wound up tonight about that. But Martinez would be smart to throw his lot in with them because if anybody knows even a teeny bit as a casual boxing fan about smaller weight divisions, if you say the super flyweights, super fly, you see that glimmer of recognition, they get it. And Estrada and especially Chocolatito are the bigger names. So what makes the Estrada 
and Roman Gonzalez fight interesting is I agree with you, Michael, at this point, Estrada to me is the number one man in that division and the, by far the most powerful and, and he, he's truly at the top of the food chain right now. Gonzalez in a lot of ways though is the star attraction so it's a great matchup it brings a lot of the elements you need together to put a big fight exciting fight together interest get the money involved i'm sure it'll be next year i'm sure they're going to do their best to try to wait until they've got the ability to tap a venue where fans can attend and boy can you imagine what it would have been like to see saturday's card in front of a Mexican full house, you know, for, for just a little part of me this weekend, you know, I'm reading, okay, it's taking place in the TV Azteca studios. And my mind wanders thinking Azteca stadium, a hundred thousand crazed fans would have just been the best thing ever. It's fun to think about. So Martinez should move up, join the party. I think he'll do great there. He's young. He is a buzzsaw. You know, let's not even get started about the issues we have talked about many times on this show about fighters making weight. I get it. He was a late replacement. Five pounds in a lower weight division, though, that's a lot. You could maybe forgive a late, super middleweight, light heavyweight last minute replacement edging toward that a, a, a flyweight well hell no you know to me if you're just up into the next weight class a little bit okay but oh he was blasting past that so he was not eligible to win a title um it put julio cesar martinez in a bad spot you know he has to decide am i going to take on this bigger guy it just shows what kind of talent he's got that he absolutely blasted him right out. It, it was, you know, it was spectacular looking. We, you know, we really barely got a look at him. I mean, he scored a knockdown in the first minute of the round. He has immense punching power for a flyweight. And he's got the ability to switch to southpaw. He can land power shots from either direction at will with pretty much no risk and yeah he, he's a phenomenon he's he's the heir apparent once the net the current generation decides to retire when estrada roman gonzalez uh, and let's all not forget about Srisa cat sorong who claims he's still wants to fight these guys again and get back yes. in it uh he's out there he should join the party and and he'll be the one to lead the next generation um, of competitive uh, super flyweights. Indeed. Let's move on to some more bouts. And I'm going to you, Lisa. There was a, a three fight uh, card uh, on Showtime. Uh, Malik Hawkins, young uh, junior bouts away from Baltimore. He got stopped in seven by uh, Subaru Matias. Um, a young fighter from Sacramento, Xavier uh, Martinez. He survived a very, very tough test winning by. Unanimous decision over Cardio Morales, in spite of getting knocked down twice in round eight. I'm going to focus on the main event of that card that took place in Uncasville, Connecticut. Uncasville, Connecticut at the Mohegan Sun. And that was a fight between um, Sergey Lipinets and really unknown Canadian by the name of Custel Clayton. Um, fight was for an uh, interim belt, interim IBF, uh, welterweight belt, welterweight title, I believe it was. Um, and the fight was ruled a draw. Uh, I wrote about this. I did recap for this fight for and that entire card for Three Kings Boxing. Just uh, if you want to check out my work there, just go to threekingsboxing.com where I'm a writer uh, for Three Kings. Shout out to uh, the folks behind Three Kings, 2K, uh, the man behind Three Kings, Bo, head of media relations, as well as um, the other uh, staff, senior writers, uh, Bakari, um, a bit cool. And the editor read. Uh, anyway, the fight going to the fight itself. I wrote about this. I tried to be ex objective in my recap as I could, uh, but in watching the fight itself, Lisa, am I wrong uh, 
that even though the fight was a draw, am I wrong in believing that it was Clayton who won that bout? Because I was watching him and didn't know much about him beforehand, but he did an excellent job of boxing all night long. Excellent job of staying disciplined. Um, terrific condition. The jab was there. The combinations were there. Uh, he gave Lippinitz fits from round one to round 12, and Lip Lippinitz could not really solve the puzzle. Uh, in my estimation, Clayton, he was he was the name that was on my mind after the fight. I just felt he won. What do you think? Yeah, I think he won too. Um, it was a close fight. Well, no, I think he was more crafty. Um, Lippinets had his moments in the fight, but um, I think the guy was just crafty. I didn't really know much about him. Like I did a little studies on him, but I, I predicted that Lippinets would win, but um, I was wrong. Well, I didn't expect a draw. So maybe they was going with the house fighter more, you know, just to save face. I'm not sure, but um, I definitely, you know, I'm looking out for this guy. Uh, he's very crafty. Really good boxer. Me and my guys was talking about him. And they was like, yeah, he's a good boxer. And he was giving him fits. You're right. Just couldn't solve the puzzle. Couldn't solve the puzzle. But, you know, sometimes I guess Lippinets was the one that was favored. So maybe that's why they called it a draw. But I have a question. Um, I don't want to derail the conversation. Do they have to have a... Uh, a rematch, or who's going to be the mandatory for uh, Spence then? I mean, in order to have, uh, uh, in order to determine that they're going to have to fight uh, 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 a rematch, both guys were rated in the top six by the IBF. Um, I'm going to assume that they're going to uh, uh, dance again. Uh, I, I hope so. You know, the question for me uh, will, how, two questions, how will both men adjust. How will Lippinets adjust to uh, uh, the boxing style um, against a Clayton in a possible rematch? Will he do a better job of cutting off the ring? And can Clayton fight at that level? Right. He definitely, Clayton would have to, um, you can't leave any um, thing, you can't leave it up to the judges with something like this. He didn't come in the favorite, so he would definitely have to come in and, um, you know, maybe a few knockdowns or whatever. That's how it is in boxing. Um, you know, like I said, I, I really didn't know much about the guy, but I'm looking, looking at him now. You know, he's a good boxer, very crafty. Indeed, indeed, he's 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 the type of fighter, uh, Daniel and Gail um, Clayton, who may not, based on what I've seen, what I saw in this fight against. Against Lippinets, he comes off as a guy who doesn't do one thing especially particularly great. He come he 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 comes off as a guy who's well schooled and does everything well. Uh, mm. uh, he moves he moved very well in this fight. Uh, uh, Daniel and Gail um, used the angles very well. Um, excellent punch displacement. Um, no, he knew. Not just what punches to throw, but when to throw them to keep lipping nets off balance throughout. Uh, very good boxing brain. And again, the conditioning and, and, and the discipline was A1. Um, before we go to a question in the chat from official uh, scorecard boxing science about our previous discussion, um, you can start it. You, you first, Daniel, and then you, Gail. Um, I'll repeat the question to you that I repeated to that I asked of Lisa. Am I wrong in thinking that even though the fight was ruled a draw, am I wrong in believing that Clayton was the guy who really should have really deserved to have his hand raised in victory? You probably would not be wrong in that sense because that's the nature when a fight gets that close into a draw. There's enough gray room, gray spaces where you can make a case for either guy, but 
I I cannot make that much of a case for Lipnitz in this one, especially when you feel like this was just a formality in a way. It was supposed to be Lipnitz versus Spence after everything gets handled, but then looked to be the case whether that lack of preparation on Lipnitz's team, underestimating your opponent, that all that factors into it, but at the end of the day, the results are the results. They should rematch. I think IBF rules say that they have to because it's not a situation where a fight was hurt or a fight was disqualified, so they would have to go the next person down. They have to in order to ensure the mandatory. And if anything, it's probably a blessing in disguise for Errol Spence because he, he can focus on this fight with Garcia or try to do the logical thing and push this as far back as they can. Or they can try to put an interim fight in between because I said he can get a gimme fight because he's just look what he's coming back from. But then afterwards, handle the mandatories because as long as you don't have a mandatory, the IPF cannot force you to fight one. That's probably a lesson that Kell Brook probably wish he would have, or an opportunity that Kell Brook probably wish he would have had during his tenure, where he got lost in the shuffle, unfortunately, because the IBF actually makes you fight your mandatories. So it's a break for Spence because he, remember, not only is looking for the big fights, he's also looking for that one other fighter that has a WBO belt, who you have named as a pound for pound number one, but has done, unfortunately, not a lot ring to warrant it this year. Granted, the pandemic is a vote. Close. <laughs> what say you about this fight between uh, uh, Clayton and Libanet's Gale? You know, it was interesting uh, in the week or two leading to the fight, listening to trainer Joe Goosen, who trains Lipinets. Uh, you know, Lipinets. Uh, was originally scheduled to face an uh, opponent from Belarus who had visa issues. The fight got delayed two weeks to try to let him straighten out his visa issues. Didn't work. Another opponent was proposed who was a southpaw. Goosen and Lipinet said, okay, we're all right with that. Uh, Goosen um, thankfully had some southpaw sparring partners, and he said he had sparred both orthodox and southpaw sparring partners with lipping nets all along so he felt okay with it wasn't a few more days before they said well uh whoops never mind about that how about this guy from canada okay so they said yes you know goosen has been around a long time he's unflappable he said you know you do what you need to do he said he's versatile enough with the training he provides that you know, it's really not super critical. And, and Lipinet seemed to be fine with it. So the question I had in my mind is, okay, here's a guy with an 18 to no record, healthy percentage of knockouts. He's fought all his career in Canada. He was a Canadian Olympian. That's certainly an accomplishment. So is he a Steve Rolls kind of Canadian? <laughs> or is he more, you know, a Jean Pascal type Canadian? Well, he wasn't a Steve Rolls Canadian, so he benefited really from some low expectations. He turned out to be a very credible opponent, worthy, skilled, patient, busy, all the things you want to see. But boy, you, when you come in, you know, sort of with no reputation, you know, your resume the numbers are there, but there's not a lot of flesh to it. You know, anybody in that sort of challenger position, you have got to take away the fight from the better known guy with the well, much more well-known and acknowledged track record. I really did think Clayton won the fight. Barely. Uh, he did, by the way, win all the last three rounds on every judge's scorecard, every single one of them. And it still ended up in a draw. Now, it was a majority draw. Two of the cards were a draw. The third card gave Clayton the fight by one round. Mm -hmm. So they're going to need to do it again. 
Daniel, you know, isn't it amazing that it's notable that you took time to make a comment that the IBF actually does make people fight their mandatories. <laughs> amazing. I would welcome seeing him again. You know, really, if you look through what fighter raised his stock most the entire weekend, Gaio Estrada's stock was already pretty high. Quadras, you know, we knew he was capable perhaps in the past, and we saw again that he still got it. But, you know, Clayton is the man who we knew nothing about and all walked away saying, ah, good on you. You look good. Let's see him again. You know, if he had been able to land even a slightly uh, better aimed, directed power shots, you know, he might have won that fight outright. He just couldn't do it. You know, when you have a fight put together at the last minute like this, I'll, I'll grant both guys a little bit of a pass, even though trainer Joe Goosen had made it clear to all of us over and over in the week up to the fight. No, 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 we're ready. Nope, doesn't make a difference. Now we're good. Yeah, they maybe weren't as prepared as he wanted to let on. And it could be a case that he just maybe, that he maybe just underestimated um, Clayton because he was such an unknown uh, uh, quality um, heading, heading in. I hope that these two are able to... Uh, get in the ring and scrap uh, for, in, a, in a rematch because um, it would be a real shame that Clayton, see Clayton for me, he's a, he's a one, he's based on what I've seen and based on interviews during, during after the fight, especially, he seems to be one of these honest, um, hardworking um, guys who do, just comes in and does his job, does yeoman's work throughout, uh, always stay prepared. It would be a shame if this would be the only time that we'll see him. Uh, he deserves a rematch. He should get a rematch, and hopefully he'll land it uh, once again on Showtime uh, uh, later on this year. And it will, we will see if that the performance that he put on uh, against Lipinets, uh was that is that truly does that truly indicate what kind of fighter he is, or was that was it a case of him just fighting fighting ab ab above his head? Uh, we will only find out that question. Should these two uh, uh, rumble again, and hopefully it'll happen um, early next year. Before we move on to um, talk about them, some news, I'm going to share a question for everybody here um, from official uh, scorecard boxing. Um, for everybody, we're going to post it here uh, for everybody to see. In our discussion about um, Estrada, Chocolatito, and uh, and Julio Cesar Martinez, official scorecard box acts. He's asked, the question he puts on the table is, does anyone think that Estrada may be at the beginning of the decline? And have, um, he asked the question about Jay Harris and Braithwaite. Unfortunately, I did not see that. But I want everybody to answer the first question he asked. Do you think that, I guess, because of, of how he struggled against Quadras, the fact that he was knocked down, um, is, is Gallo on the, at the beginning of decline here? Oh, uh, no, not at all. Um, far from it being any decline by Estrada, um, I think you've got to give the credit to Quadras for really knowing this was kind of his last big shot. You know, he, he knew that his options would start being limited with a loss at this point. You know, he's coming in to try to avenge a loss in this rematch. So he's the guy that's got to tip the whole uh, scale over in his favor so to his credit he must have trained his ass off he brought it maybe if anything Estrada expected you know the level of the first fight which clearly he came out far more aggressively far earlier and I wish more fighters would do that Vasily Lomachenko <laughs> I mean yeah we got a very good example the previous week of how fighters suffers when they give away too many early rounds thinking that they're going to take their time and cautiously assess what's going on. You know, you got to step on the gas sometimes a little quicker. And whether Quadras had planned that or saw what happened the week before, whatever it was, he did absolutely the right thing. You know, really in that case, 
there isn't a lot for you to lose. We're still all talking about how surprised and impressed we were at his performance. I mean, is there anybody here within the sound of my voice who wouldn't want to see him again? I welcome see him, seeing him again. And I can't say that in the last six, 12 months, I've given Carlos Quadras a whole lot of thought. What say you, uh, Daniel and Lisa, in terms of the question that official boxing asked in, in terms about uh, Juan Francisco Estrada? I think he got a few more in him, you know, a few more wars. I just hope, you know, that, uh, <sighs> you know, when I see those guys get hit like that and constantly get hit, it just, you know, I know he has defense and everything, but, uh, you know, he, 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 what is he, 29 now? Estrada, I, I want to say, Estrada uh, is 30. 30. He's 30. He's turned okay. 30. Yeah. I, I oh. hear you. Lisa. I hear you. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, I just, I just, it's like, oh gosh, you know, all of those body shots and everything, but I know he's at the top of, he's at the top right now. So I'm sure he has some, something left in the tank. Definitely. And definitely this uh, Roman Gonzalez fight is going to be a real chess match. There's going to be a lot of th punches thrown and, um, whew. I, I take my hat off to those guys because they don't really get the fanfare that they deserve and they take a lot more punishment. They really do in a smaller body frame, you know, so it's like they take a lot of punishment and they do and they do a lot of body work. You know, the good news is you you do overall recover a little faster from the body work. Uh, if you watch the entire to the entire end of the broadcast, you know, Quadris, I mean, after the fight got stopped, you would assume he was in bad shape. Uh, you know, he was up and around, chatting with everybody, he had a smile on his face. You know, their powers of recovery is just sort of astonishing. Um, but I do think as I have gotten older and I watch wars like that, you know, the first one where I was equally thrilled, excited, loved it, but also had that feeling of, oh, man, I hate seeing him take that kind of punishment, was Salito Vargas. You know, you watch that and think, boy, oh, that's yeah, yeah. a hard way to earn a living, friends. And it, hey, they do it voluntarily. I get it. We yeah. love it. We talk about it. But as the older I've gotten, the, the less I love it. And the more I'm willing to see the referee stop and save a guy from himself because they've got a lot of years to live after they leave the ring. They've got families, in large part, counting on them. And damn, you know, I I sometimes really do wish for the quick knockout because it just takes even a brutal knockout takes so much less out of these guys. But, you know, props to them. Think about it, folks. They do this to earn a living and for our entertainment. You know, that's that's astonishing. Yes, yes. The, the latter part of his question, I didn't see that fight or of officials. Okay. Yeah. Um, quickly, Daniel. Gallo starting to decline or is he, does he still got a little left in the tank? He has a little bit more left in the tank because there's some motivation for him. I, I can see, but like I said, more than likely it's probably more to what we heard about what's happening with Quadras during fight week that falls into when looking to a fighter when it comes into decline. But in many ways, he did a fairly better job than he did in the first fight against Quadras. But we know what the motivation is. Is, is in many ways to avenge a win, in a way. They're, that first fight between Jaratito and Estrada. There are many people, myself included, that thought Gallo actually won that fight. So this is another step for Gallo to come in and fully cement that, yes, I actually won that fight. And yes, I'm actually at this stage better than him. So I would love to see it. And 
Porsche didn't see the other fight. But I still, yeah, Gallo probably has good mind left in the tank. I'm going back to you, Daniel, to talk about this next topic. And uh, well, this going, I'm going back to you, Daniel, as we transition to the news segment. Um, I mentioned how I wrote about the Showtime um, uh, uh, triple header for Three Kings Boxing. I also penned an article for, on ThreeKingsBoxing.com in terms of about one Floyd Mayweather. Um, as most boxing fans know, Mayweather um, got a lot of attention recently. Um, during an appearance at a public workout session for uh, Javante Davis, um, Tank Davis is going to fight Leo Santa Cruz uh, on the 31st. We're going to talk about that fight in a few. But uh, at that workout, public workout section at the uh, Mayweather Gym in Vegas, um, Floyd went on a bit of a, a rant about the state of the game, and particularly when it comes to the issue of there being too many titles. Um, within the division and just too many titles in the sport. Um, I'm going to try to quote him as best as I can. Uh, how did he say? I, he says, I want to say this. I want to say this thing right now about the sport of boxing. And I, I want everybody at home to hear me when I say this. A belt, I'm tired. He says when I'm, he's at home, um, he's in talking about in terms of uh, himself and, and, and any boxing organization or whatever. He says, I don't care if it's top rank, if it's Golden Boy, if it's Mayweather Promotion, if it's PBC. Um, there's too many champions in the sport, in, in the sport of boxing right now. Too many champions. It's not such a thing as a super champion. Not at all. And I'm not taking anything away from no other fighter. This, he just says it's too many belts. Um, and he went on to go off about the fact that there's too many belts and how in his days and how in, in, in previously uh, – that wasn't the case and just overall that is not good for the sport here's my thing and i'll go to you daniel when you read and listen to what floyd says about the sport about the proliferation of titles throughout the sport itself or even in his division and he went on to talk about the wba and regular champion and super champion and all that my thing is daniel okay floyd you are absolutely right However, what are you going to do about it? And the reason I say that, Daniel, is he's talked about how uh, the big companies need to come together behind closed doors and uh, come to one accord to kind of so they can just make moves and flush the system out or buck against the or rage, or rage against the machine, uh, to quote the, uh, the name of one of my favorite uh, 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 rock groups, right? He's talking about how they how him and other entities, power brokers in the sport can do this, this, and this, and that. My question is, Daniel, instead of going on camera and talk about doing it, one, why doesn't he do it himself? Two, I can absolutely agree with his assessment that his assertion that there are too many titles in the sport, right? And champions need to fight each other. The best need to fight the, to fight the best. But at the same time, Daniel, he says that, but it's not being applied to his fighter. The fighter I'm talking about, Javante Davis. This is the same Tech Davis who's been a champion for three years, since 2017, over three years now, right? When has Tank, when has Floyd made serious efforts to put Tank in, in a unification bout? When Tevin Foreman was the I, was the uh, IBF champion at 130 pounds, when Tevin Foreman was a champion at 130 pounds, they could he could have fought him, right? And we know how Loma has openly talked about wanting to fight Tank Davis. Have you heard Floyd make any moves about that fight? He's always pushed it off. He's always brushed it off, and he always brushed it off, and this and that. When you put that in context of what he did with Badu Jack, when Badu Jack was super middleweight champion, and he put him basically straight away into a fight, a unification fight against uh, James DeGale. It's one thing for Floyd to make this rant. All I guess all I'm saying is live by your word. Don't just say it. Don't just talk about it. Be about it. Be about it and making in terms of making serious moves behind the scenes. And if you want to talk about the best fight and the best, be about it make it happen in terms of your own fighter and putting him in the ring against the best 
at 130 or 135 because when you because there have been opportunities to do so and so far you have not done it floyd i know that was a long-winded rant myself just like floyd's rant was long-winded but <clears throat> you're reacting to what floyd said and i guess to my response to what floyd to what floyd is uh, ranting about So I'm going to try to be as cordial as possible, Mr. Mayweather. And I'm, but I'm about to be, be as blunt as I can. You wasn't talking that shit when that's benefiting you. I'm sorry. You, I'm not going to buy it from somebody that benefited from that system of having regular champions or super champions in the WBA. What you're probably bitching about now is is the fact that even though you're fighting for technically a lightweight title in the WBA, we all know the actual champion fought not too long ago. <clears throat> and is on the other side of the fence where Tank is likely not going to get a shot unless he leaves you. That's one thing. That's one area when I look at it per look at it personally, but on the other side, he is technically right because the WBA has been the most suspect when it comes into this, when it comes to regular champions, interim champions, super champions. And it was one thing where they were the ones doing it. The WBC started to do it, but they had some grounds to do it. Like maybe a fighter was injured, they crowned an interim champion champion but then they came out with this stupid franchise idea which makes absolutely no sense now with the way that they recognize it because as far as i'm concerned Devin haney is still the wbc lightweight champion right <clears throat> and on top of that then you have the other sanctioning bodies the WO is starting to do this interim champion deal. The IBF has been the last one that has done weird things into this. So you may be right, but you also have to look at your motivations. You put you're about to have a fight on pay-per-view with a title <clears throat> that really does not mean anything. Because the actual belt is on the other side of the street. So that's one aspect of it when you when you have to look into it. And like I said, it, it didn't matter to Floyd when he benefited from those areas. But probably what also it would have bothered him before because there was that time period where Floyd had the WBC, WBA belts. At welterweight, and then when he fought Pacquiao, he got the WBO belt. There was only one belt left. Well, yeah, we all knew he was the best of welterweight at that point, but there was still one belt left. So I can get at that aspect, and but at the end of the day, you benefited from that system. You didn't say anything when it benefited you. Now that you can see on a, uh, from a business standpoint that it's not going to benefit you, <coughs> when. Unfortunately, you do. The TMT stable is does not have a good strong force when it comes to the top level fighters. They do have some really good kids that are gonna they're gonna be building up, but it's gonna take them a while in order for them to get into real good contender status. The cup was pretty bare when it comes to him. And like I said, the top level fighters, because unfortunately with Bottle Jack, unfortunately, he's been shot out. And then Tank, Tank in many ways, he also sabotages himself with some of the things that he does. So and we I almost before I forget, we, he did he did mention like Tevin Farmer and Lomachenko. He never put them in there because I think we all knew we all know that if Tank and Tevin Farmer would have fought, Tevin Farmer would have won. 
and in many ways, he kind of used the Loma fight as a punishment. He's like, if you don't act up, I'm gonna put you. To, I'm gonna put you in front against Loma, so you so you'll get embarrassed. So that's the aspect of it. Like you, you can be right, but you can also be very wrong at the same time. I, I'll go to you, Lisa. Um, I, uh, for the record, I think if if, if Tank and Tevin Foreman would have fought, um, it was my belief. I believe that actually uh, Tank Davis would have beaten Tevin would beat Tevin Foreman. But the overall, uh, but in the overall thing is, is there space in this conversation to kind of affirm Floyd's a uh, basic uh, argument about there being too many fighters in the sport and the fight need. In the, in the best need to fight the best while at the same time holding room out for criticism of him in, in, in terms of what he has not been doing with his chief guy who's been in our opportunity, who, who's had the opportunity, who has the opportunity to fight the best and is not doing it, who has, to, and who's also taking advantage of himself of the same system of regular champions and super champions and all this stuff. I mean, my goodness, Lisa, this is the same dude who's fighting for a WBA uh, a regular champion in one division in lightweight and then fighting a super champion in junior lightweight in, 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 in Santa Cruz at all in one fight. So he's talking about the confusion of the belts. Well, he's putting his fighter to continue on that confusion, given the WBA. Right. Um, I agree with his stance, but... Uh... My sentiments exactly to you, Michael, and uh, Daniel, uh, he benefited from, you know, the four belt system, um, even though I don't I don't think he exactly had all of them consecutively. But, uh, you know, <clears throat> I agree that there's too many belts uh, and it would never, in my opinion, there would don't there would have to be a, a governing body to to uh put in position to make sure that each sanctioning body would do what they're supposed to do if it would still be a four belt system but um unfortunately it's not and um it's 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 like uh I heard somebody say recently to in today's climate, it's almost like undisputed is it's it's kind of hard because of the way things are set up today. And um and you got the okay, you got the four belts, and then you have the lineal, the ring. It, it just gets really uh for for the fan coming in, it will be really confusing to explain it to them. Even some of us are just trying to learn the guidelines to each sanctioning body and everything, but they are not accountable to anyone. So I agree with his stance, but uh it's just like uh it's it's crazy just trying to keep up with all of this. And it's not even um, you know, where's the legacy at? It, it gets really confusing, you know, like everything, like and um, I it's it's just hard to try try to put it into words. And um, what 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 can he do? Yeah, is there a restructuring going on that we may not know about that's going on in the background? I don't know. It could be, but uh, I me personally. In my opinion, if there was a governing body overseeing all four sanctioning bodies, then every title holder should be in a tournament to see who is the top guy in each division. See, in, a Lisa, world, in a perfect see, world, that would be great, but it's not like that. I was gonna say, see, Lisa, you see, you, 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 you're guilty of making too much sense, sounding too much that, like right. But that, that's how it should be. I mean, every other sport is like that. Why is over here it's the shithole is like this? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to curse. No problem, no problem. <laughs> it doesn't stop anybody else. <laughs> Listen, it's never gonna happen. 
I think we I think we can all agree we're 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 a bar of sailors here. <laughs> you know, I the way this all went all came down was very interesting. So we're leading up to the Davis Santa Cruz fight. Both had their media workouts. Normally we would attend in person. That's not possible anymore. So PBC is and Mayweather Promotions uh, under that banner this week are holding the virtually. In this case, they're not, they're broadcast openly. A lot of the media workouts take place. You're given the link. It's not public. It's limited. This case, no, there's a big platform. Anybody that can find the Showtime um, YouTube channel could watch. And Tank's workout was scheduled for 9 p.m. Eastern time, 6 p.m. Pacific slash Vegas. That's unusual. Uh, it's a little weird to have it at night. Normally they're during the day. The last time there was a major workout at night, it was that strange pop-up stealth workout Deontay Wilder did several years ago, and that ended really badly. This one gave me the same feeling, and sure enough, Floyd decided to completely sidetrack. Gervonta was a half hour late. He showed up. He did most of the workout in long sleeve t-shirt. <clears throat> it tells me hey. he's, he's having issues getting down the weight. But uh, gosh, maybe. Do you say, say think so? Okay. He did very little work in the ring. By comparison, we'd seen Leo Santa Cruz the day before, absolutely killing it, crushing it. Uh, whacking on his brother with the heavy pads, talking about his dad, how things are going in the family, like the interview, really a well done event. This one is just, it's, it's seeming weird, it's starting late, it's just weird. So as Tank is transitioning to, I think from the ring to the heavy bag, they decide, okay, they're going to kill a few minutes and talk to Floyd. And Floyd completely hijacks the rest of the night. And off he goes. And everybody watching knew we were in for a dose of Mr. Mayweather's mind. And, you know, he wasn't completely wrong. One of, his, one of the things he said, which I started screenshotting and quoting him, and a lot of us did because we knew this was going to make news, there are too many champions in boxing. It's like winning an amateur trophy. Everybody's a champion. He's right. But what's the fix? So the fix is for everybody to say, you know, we need to jump off the cliff to fix this. We all got to jump off the cliff, start over. You go first. I'll follow you. I'll, you jump off that cliff first and I'll follow you. Come on. It's not going to happen. I'll recommend to anyone a recent interview done by Mauricio Suleiman, who is the chairman of the World Boxing Council, WBC. That's the green belt they all want. The architect of the super champion appeared on the podcast done by The Athletic, um, hosted by writers Lance Pugmire and Mike Coppinger. Uh, for once, Mike Coppinger's obnoxious, chew, chew your end of your sleeve approach um actually I almost didn't go far enough with um you mean he, he, on. but it's interesting to hear him defend it he mean is the not, fact that he was the, the fact that he can be an asshole actually work for him this time you know actually it did yeah i think that would that's a good way to put it he but suleiman you know i'll give him credit he made the best possible case he could he also talked about the new weight division he wants to carve out between cruiserweight and heavyweight. That's another story. I, I highly recommend everybody take a listen. But the problem is that boxing is not like the NFL, a monopoly run by a commission. Not like the NBA, a monopoly run by a commission. Not like the UFC, a monopoly run by a single guy who owns everything. He's the employer, he's the manager, he's the promoter. He's the sanctioning body, and we're talking about Dana White. That's why Dana White has complete control of the product. In the case of the UFC, it has worked beautifully from the fan perspective. He can put together whatever programming and whatever matchups he wants. 
the the one big loser in UFC are the fighters. They do not earn a fraction of the money even a m modestly accomplished boxer does. That's why guys like Conor McGregor come over and want to box. You don't see guys like Terrence, maybe Terrence Crawford, because he's got a wrestling background, will do this one day. But you generally don't see the top champions clamoring to say, hey, I want to challenge those guys over at UFC because there's nothing in it for them. Nothing. So, yeah, I, I would really not like to see the men and women who are putting it on the line not get at least half, if not the majority of the money. UFC fighters of, of the total revenue end up getting about 20% of, of all the monies in a given evening their share. Um, a boxer, it's the opposite ratio. Um, even when it's a bigger split with the promoters, you know, they're still getting a sizable chunk of whatever money is floating around, 50%, you know, up to some of them who could command 80%. So the only way the UFC fighters make any more money is side deals, promotions, sponsorships. They start bottling their own brand of whiskey. All due credit to Connor. He's making some dough on proper 12. I, I don't want to go that way either. So what's the solution? You know, Floyd, you're going to have to jump over the cliff first. You want everybody to jump off? Lead the parade. Yeah, and, and, and at the end of the day, I think we can all agree on one thing while the, the, the basis, the crux of what Mayweather is trying, is uh, suggesting, is arguing, uh, we can all uh, be in line with. But again, um, it's one thing to talk at what things are you going to do behind the scenes to make what you want, make what you're arguing happen? Uh, what steps are you willing to take uh, in terms of your fighter? who's a world champion um, in terms of what you're going to do behind the scene um, as well. So, uh, and I think um, Gail, she, I, I mentioned Gail, she had to uh, uh, leave early and she had to, and yes, she's just leaving. So uh, for those who want to follow Gail and, and talk about boxing, who want to talk about um, media because she does teach media on the side Um for those who want to talk dancing with the stars with her, or for those who want to check her out on TMZ, because uh, she's pretty much a regular now on TMZ. She appears on there, I believe, at least once a week. You can check out Gail's uh, boxing writing um, over at Communities Digital News at on comdiginews.com, C O M M D I J I news.com, or you can check her out on Twitter um, at PR Pro San Diego. And I want to thank Gail for joining us on the show. Um, now that just, uh, you, uh, Lisa, and Daniel, let's move on to some fights here. As I mentioned at the start, there's so many, so many fights this weekend, uh, particularly on the 31st. There's some fights on the 30th as well. Jaime Munguia um, fighting Terriano Johnson in a uh, middleweight contest on the 30th. And I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think who fights on that undercard. Um, Rashidi Ellis, uh, a rising a promising welterweight prospect. He's fighting on an undercard, but I want to talk about all the fights that's happening on the 31st. And what I'm going to do is Lisa and Daniel, because there's so many fights, um, it will take another hour to get um, you two to um, opine about all of those fights. So I'm going to split these fights up um, if you don't mind. And, and I'll go to you, Lisa, and I'll talk to you. I'll begin things by mentioning the aforement by talking about the aforementioned Javante Davis, who's fighting Leo Santa Cruz at the Alamo Dome, Alamo Dome, I believe, um, in San Antonio on Halloween. I mean, look, uh, Santa Cruz, highly accomplished guy, has won belts set 18, 118, 122, 126, and is a champion now in 130 pound versus um, Davis, who we talked about, um, had a media workout. Had a, uh, a workout, public workout session for the uh, uh, local media that was aired live on Showtime's uh, YouTube channel. Um, Tank is talented, but Tank has had his issues in and out of the ring in terms of making weight and whatnot. Uh, Gail mentioned how he was wearing a big, heavy uh, uh, um, sweatsuit 
uh, while working out. Um, as much the bigger two questions, not just how he's going to do in this fight, but whether he can make the weight, whether he can make 130 pounds comfortably. Um, your thoughts on this fight, uh, assuming Tank makes the weight comfortably, whatever, uh, do you think that in the end, if he has no troubles, if he can get down to 130 pounds and it doesn't deplete him, a lot of people believe that he's just too big, too strong, too powerful for the likes of a Santa Cruz. Do you agree? Yes. Unless Santa Cruz really outworks him. And I just don't, I mean, I see, I could see him like out pointing tank, but tank is fast. Tank is really fast and he's explosive. Um, hmm. And he has campaigned at that weight before. Uh, he seems to be better at 130 to me than 135. But I, I'm, you know, he hasn't been at 135 long. But Leo, it looked like his punch output was a little less in his first 130 pound fight. So uh, if Leo can adjust to the if he can take the 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 power, see, I'm I'm not sure about that, but I think that Leo's gonna come in there and give it his all. But I just think that the tank is just too young, explosive, and powerful. I don't see it going past six rounds. Mm, mm. Um, I'm under, I'm in one to believe that tank is a little bit too big for Leo. Uh, Santa Cruz's only chance is, to, as you said, outwork him. And keep up an active work rate, but that, but he also has to hurt, be able to hurt Tank. And I don't think he'll be able to hurt Tank Davis. If Tank Davis comes in in shape, um, I believe he'll win. Um, I don't know if he'll knock him out. But I think he'll just be, he will overpower him in route to a decision win. Uh, I'll go to you, uh, uh, Daniel. Um, on the undercard, this is a chop. This is a big, big under. This is a big, big card. A lot of fights on this card. Significant fights on this card. Uh, Mario Barrios, a uh, promising guy, talented guy, uh, uh, um, fighting a guy by the name of uh, Ryan Carl. I don't know much about Carl, uh, admittedly. If you have seen him on video and whatnot, uh, what's, what what chance do you have, do you think he has of, of, of defeating um, the upstart and talented Barrios? Are you there, Daniel? If he's, if you, if he's, I don't think he's there, Daniel. If you want to give a word oh, on this fight, sorry Lisa, about that. Please. Mute. Oh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, oh, no, yeah, it's, I was, I was on mute. Like I said, I haven't seen enough, unfortunately, of the other guy who really weren't in the situation. But when you put a fight in this, in this upper card in the position that, you have it on the card. You mainly put it there as a showcase. So I do. I've, and from that aspect, I probably expect Barrios to handle the opponent pretty well and start building a resume that he needs to build in order for within the next year or year and a half to not just contend for a title, but hope for likely win one. I'll go to you, uh, um, Lisa, talk about this upcoming fight. Um, Regis Progress, um, former champion at 140 pounds. Uh, um, if Inouye versus Donaire uh, was not the fight of the year in, 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 in 2019, it, be, it can be argued that Progress and his uh, loss against Josh Taylor in the World Boxing Super Series Junior Welterweight uh, Tournament final was uh the fight of the year terrific contest uh ruguru lost but he was very very competitive in that bout uh made a very very good account of himself um i would argue he would have beat any other junior welterweight in the world other than uh outside of taylor that night um he's fighting a guy by the name of Geraldez. um haven't seen much of him 
but from what I've seen of him, I'm not that impressed by. Uh, maybe you can offer a different take. Uh, your thoughts on Progress, um, his debut, uh, he recently left uh, Lou DiBella, uh, fighting a one-fight deal right now uh, uh, with uh, PBC, I believe. Um, thoughts on his upcoming fight against Geraldez? Um, I don't really know Geraldez. I'm still... This week, I, I got my fights for the week, so uh, I, I have to do study on Geraldez, but uh, I definitely pick Regis, uh, Regis is a really good fighter. Uh, he's got a lot of power. Southpaw, um, you know, he's got some slickness to him. Um, he, um, I gotta really do research on this other guy, but I'm gonna take your word for it, Michael. You don't, you don't think he got a chance, so. I mean, I, 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 I've never heard of him, oh, oh, so oh, that I, doesn't I, mean anything. Huh? I will, I will say this: he's a competent guy. Um, he has decent skills. Um, he has good foot movement. And if 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 progress is not is lazy in there in terms of ability to cut off the ring and whatnot and whatnot and lazy and not doesn't put any focus to the body, you know, Horaldes could put off a surprise because I say he's a skilled guy. Decent jab, can fight going forward and going backwards. My 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 issue is Daniel. Um, does he have the strength and power to hold off Ruguru? Uh, should Ruguru decide to step it up in terms of pressure? You may correct me if I'm wrong, Mike. Is this a late replacement? As well, yes, yeah. Oh no, he's done. I'm sorry. I guess somebody like Perger, who's who's doing his best right now to rebuild and get himself back up to the picture 140, or maybe looking up to make a move about to wait, even though I would prefer to for him to stay at 140. Now I, I think it, I think if Ruger turns it on because he knows he's in a position where he can't be left days ago in that division when it comes into it, particularly now when we know that Taylor Ramirez is almost now served on the silver platter. So he needs this win. I don't think he's gonna slouch off. He's never been a person that could slouch off when it comes into a fight, especially when a lot is on the line for him. Right, and, and, and I said, uh, Geraldez, he's a, a guy, I think he's a Mayweather fighter. Um, uh, I saw him in, in a draw against R. Argus Mendez, I want to say uh, last year in May, fight took place in Barclays, I believe. Um, and, and, and Mendez, he's a decent guy. He's a decent guy. He fought a draw against him, but I just don't know if he has the overall strength and power. Uh, to deal with the likes of a rule, particularly if, Rugo, if, if progress is on his game and he decides to uh, really, really uh, 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 be aggressive. Let's move on to some other fights here. Um, I'm going to you get. I'm uh, going to you, uh, uh, Lisa. Talk about this fight. That the three fights I we just talked about is going to happen at the Alamo Dome in San Antonio. The next couple of fights that we're going to talk about is going to happen in Vegas. Um, at the bubble, MGM Grand is going to be on ESPN Plus, also on Halloween. And I said I was going to split these fights up. But I want both of you guys' opinions on these next two fights here uh, while we have a little bit of time. Not only in the way, um, as Gail uh, uh, mentioned earlier, um, this is not his first fight in the United States. This is actually his second professional fight. Uh, he fought in the United States back in 2016, September, I believe it was. Um, on one of the HBO Superfly cards. Um, anyway, coming off uh, the fight of the year in 2019 against uh, Nonito Donaire in the finals of the World Boxing Super Series Bantamweight Tournament, this is Inouye's first fight in 2020. He's stepping into the ring against a pretty competent guy uh, uh, in Jason Maloney out of Australia. Maloney, who all, also competed in that World Boxing Super Series Tournament, he lost a by decision, close decision to... Emmanuel Rodriguez. Um, Maloney is a good fighter. 
Lisa, but yeah. he's also, according to the book, he's a six to one underdog. Maloney can box. He has good power. I think it's 21 and one, 18 knockouts. So the power, so the record suggests that he has very good power. As good as Maloney is, is just is this just a simple case of him facing against someone who's just that elite, who's just that special? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, I mean, I, I, I just watched the Maloney fight not too long ago on top rank when he lost. I believe he lost the twins. Right. right. Andrew. That was Andrew, the um his twin brother who lost. Oh, that was oh okay. But I just saw an interview with uh Jason Maloney recently, and he's got such a sweet spirit. Very, very uh very nice guy. Um that's what I it, it, I took that from the interview. Really good guy. Um, but I there's levels to this, and I just <laughs> as Mayweather would say. I just don't think that uh he's at the level of uh a new way. And uh also uh this will be a good test for a new way, you know, coming off of that 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 great victory he had, but he also came off, you know, with the broken eye socket and everything. So, you know, gotta test the waters. And I, I just don't see him beating a new way at all. A new way is a, a is an elite pound for pound talent. That's my opinion. Do you agree, Daniel, with Lisa's sentiment that that in in, in terms in spite of uh, 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 the ability of, Malo- of Maloney, um, as Lisa said, quoted Mayweather, there's levels to this, and that um, um, the monster. It's just at a different level than um, Maloney. In many ways, yes. Like, anyway, has a better pedigree when it comes to amateur. He has probably the better technique, the better range, the better ring knowledge when it comes into it. But you have to, you also take into account the heart of Maloney. And we have to remember, we, when it comes to particularly recently at bantamweight, we've had fights where we felt like one fighter was probably at least a level or two above, and then we got shot. Shout out to Solani Tete on that. But I think when it comes to in- anyway, he kind of knows that he has to really make a point across and this weight classes because we know what fight's waiting for him if he goes back to Tokyo for New Year's Eve, which I, I, I don't think he can go to Tokyo, actually. Unfortunately, with the what the Japanese government apparently decided to do a couple weeks ago. But uh, for those who do not know, uh, give either way, he knows he way. has a good amount of time and a lot of time. I think apparently, this is where I heard from a couple of friends in Japan, apparently they're not really going to let a lot of people in the country in or out of Japan until next spring. That's a way to combat the pandemic. So it could be a situation where one of the Japanese traditions that we have grown to love here in boxing, the New Year's Eve fights, maybe missing the key player. So, but they may change from time to time. We know we know how money moves things. Dollars, in this case, yens may exchange hands. So you never know what could happen in that area. But I know he knows like he, this is a golden opportunity right now that you need to make your name in one of the divisions in boxing that has held a lot of weight, especially now in the U.S. with not a lot happening right now and. With basically our sports world being in somewhat level of chaos this year. Absolutely. Let's go to the uh, undercard, uh, the main, the chief undercard of that. Um, Michaela Mayer, Daniel, I'm going back to you to begin the conversation. Michaela Mayer, for the past, well, throughout this year and even into 2019, has talked a whole lot about uh, 
how good she is and how she's the best and how she's going to go down as one of the uh, go down as basically one of the um, ATGs in women's boxing. And she gets her chance to fight for a world title on the undercard against Evo Brodnicka. Uh, Brodnicka, WBO champion at 130 pounds, right? Um, Mayer's talented. She's signed with top rank. They fought, by circumstances in, in terms of COVID, in her last fight, it was a main event, so a lot of people got to see her the last time she fought. A lot of people have her as the favorite here against Brodnicka. Uh, Brodnicka's older, um, I think by Brodnicka's, I want to say 36 or something like that, well, Mayer, maybe 29, 28, 29 years old. But in watching replay of both ladies, Daniel, Am I thinking that those who are out there believing that Mayor is going to storm through this woman, Bronica, uh, they're going to be in for a surprise? Because in watching the champ, she may not be a puncher, but she, in spite of her age, she is in excellent shape. She can box, she can move, and she can move on the back foot all night long. And Mayor, the taller fighter, in most of her fights, she's at best. She's best when she have ladies come towards her, right? Where she can display her skills. I think she's going to be facing something different in this fight. We're going to see for the first time how she's going to fare when she's going to be outside her comfort zone. Because in facing this guy, in this lady, Bronica, oh my bad, my bad, this woman, Bronica. I think for the first time, she's going to have to force the fight. She's going to have to hunt uh, a woman down. Can she do it? Can she cut off the ring? She very well could be. She could be as good as she says she is. but She has the skill set to do it. Yeah, but I think she's going to be in a very, very tough fight um, on the undercard. It's not going to be easy pickings against Brodnicka, contrary to what a lot of people think. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. No, but the main thing with Bronica is she's very offensive. Yeah, she's very defensive. She's a good, good offensive fighter. Like you mentioned, Mike, she does really well at the back foot, which is going to force Mayer to become the aggressor in this fight. She's been more of a counterpuncher, which has had a lot of success in the career. And it has to be a different scenario, but she's at the weight class. Where suddenly, like somebody, like we mentioned, like Katie Taylor, may be now in the rear window, or Claire McCas, like McCaskill, is not too far. But when it comes to that area, even though it's a few weight divisions down, but we know the division, you know, the fighter is probably going to eye at this point. But that's the fight that's going to tell you. Whether you're going against somebody that's been that is a champion that has defended her title well and is forcing you to do a skill set that you are not familiar with at times, we saw this a couple of weeks ago when it came to Teofino and Loma, where a lot of people thought that Teofino was had to thought he was probably going to have to ram through Loma. Instead, he focused and did more of a jab, more of a jab and a concentrated body attack early on. This is what Michaela has to do. She has to come forward, but she has to very come forward intelligently because fighters that fight well off the bat foot, they do so by taking advantage of overly aggressive fighters, overconfident fighters. Land a quick counter right, land a nice little uppercut as you're coming in. So there's that's the main thing the mayor has to focus on. You have to become the aggressor, but at the same time, you have to make sure you use your advantages to see and avoid the counter. Because if you're able to do that, you'll be able to win this fight. And you're going to position yourself to be a player in coming areas when there's a, some good money fights that are going to be lined up for in the future if everything lines up correctly. What say you about this fight, Lisa? I don't know enough about uh, what's the other lady's name? Rodnika. Rodnika. 
again, I'm still doing my film studies. Uh, I'm learning about the ladies more, but I have seen Michaela Mayer fight. Uh, she's tall, upright, uh, you know, a counter puncher, as as, as uh, Daniel stated. Uh, it's a good fight. I got good, um, you know, um, fundamentals. Um, it should be an interesting fight based on what y'all are saying about Ronika being a defensive fighter and fighting off the back foot. So it should be a really interesting style matchup. But uh, she, if she's as talented as she says she is, I'm sure she could bring the fight to her. That's what we want to thing, okay. Fana, That's the thing. Can she uh, catch an elusive fighter, you know? But I don't know if Rodnika is her, is her uh, reflexes still the same. Has she slowed down? I don't know enough about her. But I I bookmarked her uh, in my because I I'm in this prediction league, so I have to look at these fights. So I, I haven't looked at it yet. They have to be in by Friday. <laughs> so uh, my my prediction. So I have her on there. I just haven't gotten around to it yet. But uh, I do know Michaela Mayer, and she has been talking a lot lately. And I've seen some interviews with her recently. Uh, you know, she's putting a name out there, top rank. You know, she's probably going to be the girl at top rank, you know, the top the top lady over there. So uh, I'm looking forward to see more fights with her. And uh, But it, it should be an interesting style. That's that's an interesting style matchup there. But if she's as talented as she says she is, she can uh, maybe cut that ring off, like y'all say, and uh, make that girl fight. And I mean, that going... lady. That lady fight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going back to you, Lisa, to talk about uh, uh, this next fight. We're going up to the heavyweight division here. And um, specifically talking about one Alexander Usek, um, dominant reign. Uh, uh, at, at, at cruiserweight, it can be argued that he was the greatest cruiserweight of all time. Um, moved up to heavyweight, uh, last year in 2019. Um, fighting the toughest uh, fight of his heavyweight career, heavyweight life right now is fighting Derek Tesora. Fight is going to happen in England, it's going to be air, it's going to air live on the zone. Um, my question for this is. How much does Chisora have left at this stage of his career? Um, he's been in tough fights throughout. Uh, 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 two fights with Dillian White. Um, mm. He's fought Fury. Um, yeah. He's fought David Hay, right? Um, yeah. He's been in some wars. Uh, uh, the, yeah, uh, the, the fight against Carlos Takamo, he was basically getting beat up, and then he sprung from nowhere to... Uh, 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 hurt to calm, put him down and stop him, right? Um, yeah. How much do you think he has left uh, in order to deal with the likes of Usek, uh, who may not be the biggest heavyweight in the world, but we all know the talent is there uh, uh, and the skill and the skill is there. He, it can, he may be, outside of Fury, the most technically proficient heavyweight out there right now. Right. Uh, my heart is with the underdog, Chisora, because I would like to see him go out in a great bang like that. But all that skill set, Usyk uh, has the better uh, skill set. Uh, I, I really haven't really seen much of him at heavyweight other than the, the Chad, was it Witherspoon? What was that guy's name? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then um I saw him in the World Super Series, I believe it was. Yes. Yeah, when he fought um Joe Joyce and some people. So and then the fight with Bellew as well, uh um uh, after that. That was the heavyweight? No, that was a cruiserweight. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm just stating at heavyweight. Okay. Uh I don't have enough film on him. Uh my uh I know he's a talented guy and everything. He's not my guy. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, but uh I don't know how he's gonna fare up there at heavyweight. 
Uh, he definitely has a skill set. He's a very talented fighter. His footwork is amazing. Um, the angles, the, you know, I can't take that away from him. You know, I don't know how he's going to fare with these big guys. Uh, as far as uh, Chisora, Chisora is always that wild card. You know, he can upset the party. You know, Chisora will go on some wins and then lose and then come back. You know, he's just uh, that type of guy. He, But he comes, he leaves it all in the ring. He's got a lot of heart. But uh, my, my heart is with Chisora because I would like to see him go out on a Go out in a bang. I'm, I usually root for the underdogs, but uh, but uh, skills. I, I believe uh, Usyk will win the fight based on skill set alone. I'll go to you, Daniel. Do you agree with uh, Lisa's assessment that while Chisora, uh, he is the quote unquote wild card. Uh, in the end of the day, uh, the skill and the professionalism of Alexander Usyk will be too much in the end. And, and I have a feeling that that is definitely going to be the case because Wudusik, what makes him so good is he has similar footwork to Lomachenko, but at the same time, he can also have a bit more aggressiveness to Lomachenko. I know we haven't seen it a lot of times when Russ Abner has been supposedly the person running the show in a way a lot of times, but you know that he has it in him. You know he can take a game fighter. We like, should we remind people what he did to Tony Bellew? But Chisora is very, very good fighter. He at this point we all can agree like, he's he's a European level fighter, but one of the top level European fighters that you need to go through in order to be considered legitimate as a contender in the heavyweight ranks. And this is going to be a very interesting fight because Usyk has the skill set. Usyk has the combinations. Usyk has the agility. Jasora has that crazy punch, though, at times. Like we mentioned it, like he, he, in many ways, he's a little bit like Tony Harrison. Tony Harrison can sometimes lose a fight. Into a little, oh, no, actually reverse him in many ways to Tony Harrison. You can win a fight and then lose in the last second. Oh, I'm thinking of somebody else, but ultimately with Chisora, what he has, he has to make sure is he has to avoid the counters that Usyk can have from different angles. If he doesn't, Usyk will start picking, will start landing more combinations, probably landing more to the body, and ultimately will make Chisora relent. Although I do believe believe this fight will finally go to a decision. The main factor is Chisora. Chisora needs a good punch. He needs a puncher's chance. If he doesn't have that, then it's going to be very interesting to see what Chisora is going to wind up in the future, but I expect this to win. And, and, and so do I. I just think that in the end is he's too young, he's too fresh, he's too talented. Fresh in terms of uh, no, he doesn't have any real punishment wear and tear. While, as I said earlier, uh, Chisora, he's been through some tough fights. He has been through some wars. He's been stopped as well. And I think Usek will be too much in the end. I think he'll win by decision. Um, and I think that's going to be it for the time being. I'm going to get ready to shut the show down. I want to thank, um, well, no, if you, it, I'll, I'll, I'll leave one more fight for anybody who wants to talk about it on the undercard of Usek Chisora. Uh, Lee Selby is going to fight uh, George Cambosis. It's going to be a, a, a IBF light with Eliminator. The winner is will more than likely be the man, will be the mandatory contender for uh, Teofimo uh, Lopez um, at 135. Anybody who wants to talk about it, uh, Lisa, um, Daniel, a quick word on that. Who's the guy again with Lee Selby? He's fighting a guy by the name of Cambosis. Cambosis, Cambosis. I don't know him. Hmm. No, Lee Selby. 
Give me your take on it, Dan. <laughs> well, well, it, it, it's least sell be a lightweight. Well, it's least sell be a lightweight when I already thought that least Selby wasn't that good at featherweight. <laughs> well, he was the weakest link at the champions when it came to featherweight. I could definitely see a scenario where he could probably win. And unless, like I said, unless Timofino changes his mind and actually defends his belt at 135 at least once before moving to 140, this could be a setup for Lee Selby to become the IBF lightweight champion, which I'm just going to shake my head on that. I'm, I'm going to leave it at that when it comes to Lee Selby. Um, <laughs> if anything, I'm probably be more interested in the Jaime Munguia fight, actually. Uh, your thoughts on that quickly, then, if you're more interested. First, I feel bad for Toriano Johnson. Look at the trajectory of his career. He literally had a fight. He signed the paperwork. To fight Golovkin and could probably have been one to give him the, one of his tougher challenges before Canelo. He fortunately messes up his knee and he hasn't been the same since. Like he got complete, he got taken apart in many ways by Debrachenko and he hasn't really been the same since. But he do does have enough of a skill set to warrant. This being a good step of fight for Munguia in this weight class because we kind of know that Munguia, the main thing that he lacks is defense. We love his power. We love the way he comes forward, but, uh, but we need to see some defensive prowess in him when it comes in this fight. By the way, because he, at this weight class, are you going to try to put him right now against uh, Boo Andre with, um, with no defense? Are you going to put him against yeah. Small? With no defense. So this is a good fight to learn against somebody that was a credible contender at one point. Is 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 Al is Robert Alcazar still him. his trainer? Who? Uh Toriano Johnson? No, uh Mangia. Is Robert Alcazar still his trainer, Daniel? I thought I thought he was with uh I think I thought it was still terrible. I think it's still with terrible. Okay. Oh, Morales. Thought, no, no, he's with Morales now. I thought. <laughs> yeah, Morales. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Um. Yeah. That's the yeah, main thing with, about this fight. He's with Terrible. He's with Terrible. That's the main thing. That's the main thing about this fight. Uh, uh. Um. Can we see any improvement from a defensive standpoint in terms of, uh, uh Maguia? Um. That was his main problem, 154 pounds. I hadn't seen any real improvement at 100 uh, at 160. And to answer your question, Daniel, no, you don't put him in the last with uh, uh, Demetrius Andrade at this point, or Maul, or or even uh, um, or even a Triple G at this point. Even though we hadn't seen him fight in ooh, over a year now, um, no, no, until he until he um, tightens up defensively. Um, Nah, nah, he 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 he's not ready, but I think he'll beat uh, uh, a Toriano Johnson. That's like a quick word, uh, Lisa. Yeah, uh, Toriano Johnson is a very crafty fighter. Uh, he, whew, I could see him giving him problems, but uh, at the same time, Munguia is young, strong. He's a fun fighter to watch, but I've seen subtle changes with him. But it's, it's 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 he's a work in progress. Uh, he definitely his he's moving his head more, but he definitely lacks defense defense. Uh, so it's gonna take a while for him, you know, to get that. It, it's just gonna take a while. But uh, I could see Toriano Johnson making him, you know, look bad at times. But but uh, Mongia can put in that body work too. And he's strong and big. I don't see Toriano. I I, I don't see it. I could see it going like maybe a unanimous decision for uh 
Munguia, maybe, or a late stoppage. Because Toriano Johnson is a vet, a crafty vet who has enough tools in his toolbox to at least take him, take him there. That's just my take. Okay, but well, I think we're going to set things on that note. But before we do, I mentioned Lisa how uh, uh, um, your um, New York, New Jersey um, accent through and through. And I have to I have to show this comment here from um, the Brotherhood in the chat, um, speaking about your accent. Who says of you? And I'm going to put it up public. This woman sounds like a queen, like the pride of uh, 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 <laughs> New Jeru, uh a Queen Latifah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, 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 no doubt, yeah. You know, a lot of people say that. It's so funny. But it's just a, you know, Jersey, New York, Connecticut thing, tri-state area thing, you know. But, uh, hey, I wish I had our money. (laughs) We all do, we all do, we all do. I think we're going (laughs) to, I think we're going to shut, we all do. (laughs) We're going to yeah, she has down. invested well. She has invested very well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I remember Queen Latifah, yeah. Yeah. She went, to my same, she went to my same high school, believe it or not. Say word. Uh-huh. Wow, wow, wow. The things you learned here. She was, was a little under me, like an underclassman, and her mom was an art teacher, so... Yeah, she um yeah, she she's she's a legend, yeah. And things you things you learned here uh, while discussing boxing. I think yeah, that's what's up. Uh, yeah, I but I didn't really know her because I mm-hmm. was I wasn't into she played basketball. I was I was into I don't know what I was into in high school. <laughs> I was watching soap operas and silly stuff, you know. I was caught up in Luke and Laura and all that BS back then. <laughs> Couldn't wait to get out of school. I got to go see my soap opera. <laughs> Silly, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's... <laughs> Couldn't wait to get out of school. Oh, I got to go man. see Luke and Laura. It's crazy. Yeah. Oh, man. And now instead of watching General Hospital, you can't wait to watch the fights whenever they come on. So that's where it is. <laughs> I, I actually know I'm thinking of it. I used to watch the fights with my my dad. Ah, ah. Yep. Yeah. And so indeed, I think we're going to start shutting things down on that note I mentioned. Uh, well, first of all, let me say, let oh, me give man. a shout out to the Brotherhood. <laughs> give a shout out to Official Scorecard Boxing Science. Uh, give a shout out to uh, uh, D. Obarnuli. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us on the live show. Thank you for your comments and your questions in the live YouTube chat. If you like what you heard, please hit that like button. Also hit that subscribe button and subscribe to us on um, iTunes, Spotify, uh, 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 Google Podcasts, and anywhere where podcast on any podcast plat- platform out there. And uh, please make sure to uh, leave a review on um, iTunes and on, on Spotify. Um, just a note here, um, I recently changed logo and changed formats. Uh, a few earlier this year so if you check if you look for pound for pound box report on on itunes and um spotify and the like just look for the logo that you see here with the black with the black the red the gold logo um the previous logo you got previous episodes but that's from the um previous shows in the past look for the ones with the black for the new logo black black background gold, red, coloring, and borders, and all that, that gives you all the latest episodes of Pound for Pound Box Report. Please leave a review on that particular uh, uh, form of Pound for Pound Box Report. Five-star review will get read during the show. Uh, I mentioned earlier, I want to thank Gail for joining us live on the show earlier. She had to dip out early. Um, I'll go to you, Lisa. Uh, For those who want to talk boxing and whatnot, or you mentioned how you submit your predictions into, I guess, in the league. Uh, give a shout out to that. Yeah, shout out to the Fantasy Prediction League, Champ Ross. Great league. Awesome, 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 Champ Ross. Last uh, season, I came in fourth, which I was humbled by that. But the last two, I've been doing horrible. <laughs> it's just a gamble, you know. It's just, 
it's not easy predicting these fights at times. You know, you never know. And I'm still, my eye is still not educated enough yet to technically break down uh, fights I'm learning by doing this film study. But I'm, I'm a baby in this, as far as the technical part of it. So I'm learning. I'm just going to keep learning and watching. And yeah, stay small. And stay small. Yeah. Stay humble. I mean, I'm no, I'm no, I'm no uh, uh, professional with this. I mean, listen. That's all you can. That's all we you can do. That's all we all can do. Really, if we're going to be really all honest about it. Uh, whether you're casual, novice, or or really, really serious person in this, um, the basis of this is to. One, enjoy what you're watching, and while you're doing that, just study and, and observe what you're seeing, and just a form of opinion based on, on, on that. Um, that's all you can do, and that's all you really need to do at the end of the day. Have a love for the sport, first of all, and just watch as many fights as you can, and, and whatever notes or, or, or uh, things that you can pick up from it, uh, don't be afraid to speak on it, and don't afraid to, be afraid to talk about it. Uh, no problem with being whatever standing you are just have a love for the sport first and foremost um i'll go to you daniel for those who want to talk um the sweet science for those who want to talk the nba particularly as it pertains to your miami heat who uh made it to the nba finals this past season uh let the folks know where they can find you and and, and give us an update on four boxing news or, or on the inscriber with um francis and joe from four boxing news Yes, uh, you can find me on Twitter at Rockers99, R A W K U Z 99. Definitely catch us on there. And this year has been pretty interesting. Hopefully, we'll be able to build back up in 2021, and especially catch up on some news because it's, it's looking likely, even though I deem it a mistake, probably that the NBA is probably going to start around Christmas time. That quick? No, Christmas time, yeah. Christmas 2020. Wow. That doesn't... Yeah, it... Yeah, it doesn't... I understand why, though, the one of the... The main reason is because there's no assurances that... Even waiting until wait, Martin Luther King, they, they are around February would guarantee fans in the arenas with the way this pandemic is going. And they need to recoup as much revenue as they can after losing so much because of the pandemic. So I understand it. It does screw over in many ways the Heat and the Celt the Heat, Celtics, Lakers, and Nuggets. Because these were the teams that we're the longest in the bubble. They don't have a lot of time to rest. So hopefully everybody's in the cryer chamber now because it's looking like they're going to have to be a quick turnaround because no, let's see, no preseason looks likely and also no all-star game either. Wow. Wow. I mean, that's surprised, but I guess you got to do what you got to do. Uh, for those who wanted to talk, um, Sweet science for those who want to talk music and fitness, you know what it is on social media. You can check me out on Twitter, bro Brother JR at Brother JR76, as I said at the beginning of the show. Um, find all information about Pound for Pound Box Report. The blog page is the place to go to for now. You check the right top of the page, you'll find us where to find us, where to find links all over social media of uh, Pound for Pound Box Report, where to find us on all podcast avenues. Um, where you can donate, and um, last but certainly not least, the um, link to my online coaching page. I think I may have missed sending you the invitation for the uh, November Fitness Challenge, Daniel. Um, I'll send it again just to be sure. Um, again, got a November uh, group fitness challenge, and I think I need to send you one to you as well, Lisa, if you're interested. Um, let's uh, let's build together uh, November. Uh, group challenge based around the 10 rounds workout program on beach body on demand if you're interested a boxing based program that uh, combines cardio and fitness if you're interested just hit me up uh privately on 
Twitter via uh, my personal pr Twitter, brother J R seven six, or on Papa Pop Boxing Report uh, Twitter page that is at P four P Boxing Report. Um, on the next episode, we will do a, a recap of all of these fights that's taking place on the thirty first. Uh, Javante Davis, Leo Santa Cruz, the Barrios Carl fight on the undercard of that, also Progress and Geraldez, the Inouye Jason Maloney fight. It's going to take place on ESPN Plus on the undercard of that. Um, Eva Brodnicka defending her junior lightweight title against Michaela Mayer. And also on the zone, um, Chisora Usak on the undercard of that. Selby and Cambosis, as well as Amon Gia and Toriano Johnson. That's going to be, uh, I want to say, on the zone as well. Um, and what we will do, we will do a preview of um, Luis Ortiz making his return to the ring. Um, against uh, Alexander Flores on Fox and um, Devin Haney uh, going to fight on the zone. He's going to defend his WBC title. That's right. He is the real WBC lightweight champ. Um, he's going to defend his title against um, New York and Scamboa. So uh, also on the, on the card of that rising um, heavyweight contender, um, Philip Hergovich, he's going to be fighting uh, right now, Booker. Um, so a lot of recap, fight, a lot of time will be devoted on the next week's show due to re two recaps. Uh, a lot of boxing happening on Halloween. So again, I want to thank everybody who joined us in the live YouTube chat. Um, I want to thank Gail for joining us earlier in the show. Uh, for Gail for Communities Digital News, for Lisa, for Daniel the Inscriber. Um, I'm your host, Michael. This has been episode two oh three oh four. Excuse me. What am I saying? What am I saying? Three oh four of Pound Pound Box Report, kind of a Halloween edition of Pound Pound Box Report. We will see you guys next time. Um, everyone have a good evening and good night. All right. Take care, everyone. Buenas noches.